Thank you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be in verses uh, 17 to 34. We're in a series called Church Under Fire, and we're actually going through the book of 1 Corinthians. The entire book, yep, the entire book, chapter by chapter, um, verse by verse. And um, before we even begin, one of our core values here is celebration. And I want for us just to celebrate Pastor Keith, Pastor Patty, and Pastor Anthony for how they handled this text last week. I don't know if you were, if you, I, don't, I don't know if you were here last week. Man, they got the head coverings text. A whole sermon on women in the church and how they ought to behave in the church and and about head coverings, they did a phenomenal job. Pastor Keith was funny. He, um, he said, I wonder if Pastor Darren um, plotted out this series and saw this text and scheduled his, his vacation around this text. We may never know. But I appreciate that he thinks that I am that strategic as, as if, you know, man, gosh, that is apostolic of Darren, my goodness. Today we're going to be talking about this, this collection of, of pieces where Paul is writing to the church, uh, talking to them about really how they ought to be uh, behaving. He's talking to them about their values or the lack thereof. How you know that your values determine what you value, it really actually determines how do you behave, you know? And so um, Paul is getting correspondence from a gal in the Corinthian church. Her name is Chloe. She's uh, sending him off emails, you know, and he's getting these emails, hearing about things that are happening in the church, the church that he planted. This is like, this is, this is his, like his spiritual children there in Corinth. And he's hearing about stuff that should not be happening in the church. How many of you guys have ever seen things in the church that should not be happening within the church. Wave at me. Yeah. How, yeah. How many of you have ever seen things happening in this church? No, I'm just kidding. Don't wave. No, okay. Yeah, don't. I don't see that hand. I don't see that hand. Um, and then how many know that sometimes there are things in the church that really de- do need to be corrected? And I, I am so grateful and thankful that it is Christ that has given to the church the office of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and evangelist for the equipping of the saints, for the building up, for the maturing of the body so that we're not getting pushed around and beat up and shipwrecked by every little uh, wave of new hip doctrine or heresy that comes against the church. I'm grateful for guys, uh, for apostles like uh, Bill Johnson. Apostles like Che On, apostles like, um, uh, 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 you know, um, the Dare Sorry, hey, what about um, Kansas City, uh, Mike Bickle, How, that, man, uh, so many, uh, it, this might catch you off guard, but even guys, even cats that would never necessarily subscribe to that kind of title, but even guys like um, Rick Warren, you know, like there, uh, we could actually go through countless names within countless Christian traditions, these leaders that God has established that don't have a problem with speaking up when things are out of tune within the body, because the body of Christ oftentimes needs to be tuned. And so um, I appreciate that, and we're going to see it within the text. Paul's going to be talking today about when you gather, when you come together, when you, when you church it up, and he's going to be talking about some things that are so significant, that are so serious, um, that they need to be addressed. And that's how you, you know an apostle, um, because they don't have a problem when speaking up, talking about stuff, addressing stuff. How do you know that you're loved? Because... The person that loves you tells you the truth. Hey, I don't think that's a good idea. But I really, 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 really want to do it. I know, but I love you. So here's, here's the truth. And this is what Paul does within the Corinthian church. Each and every week, we're talking about really kind of these big issues um, within the church. And we're looking at it here in Seattle, here at Sierra Bible Center, saying, Hey, look, listen, right here in the midst of first century revival, they had a lot of issues. So then if we're human, by the way, you are, okay? And if we're not perfect, which by the way, you're not, then if they would need rebuke, instruction, and discipline, why wouldn't we need that? 
And the question is, is do we have the humility, do we have the honesty to allow God's word to speak to us so that anywhere our heart is hard and needs to be softened, we can invite Holy Spirit to come, we can repent, we can shift, we can change, we can grow, we can upgrade. And that's, that's the opportunity. Good news is, if you've never been to church before or if it's been a while, you're not going to be shamed today. Okay? The good news is you're going to be invited today to go up to the next level. Okay? To the word. Here we go. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. But in the following instruction, I do not commend you. I don't, appra- I don't praise you. I, I don't applaud you. Because when you come together, it's not for the better. It's actually for the worse. How bad would that be? If we got a, um, a, a message from Bill Johnson, like, Sierra Vital Center, I am not applauding you. You're actually worse off for doing church meetings. Can you imagine hearing that? That would be like, jeez, oh, oh, ah, eh. it hurts. That's what Paul wrote to the church. You're worse off for meeting. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Because... When you come together, okay, verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there's division among you. Thank God there's no division in the American church. Thank you, Jesus. He goes, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, there are divisions, and I believe in part that there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So he says, within your tribe, there are tribes. And the problem is that those tribes are acting very tribal. The tribes within the tribe are attacking each other. I I want you to imagine that you're like me, Pastor Darren, that you're a football coach, okay? And that you've got a team that you're uh, not a football coach. But anyways, um, you got a team and there's a lot of division on the team. You're supposed to go out on the big game day. You're supposed to go out and face the opposition, but you can't win any games. Why? Because there's so much division on your team. Your team's not playing like a team. Your team's playing like a whole bunch of micro teams and a bunch of teams that hate each other. Welcome to the Corinthian church. Paul says that you've got tribes within, tri- within tribes and your tribes are fighting and they hate each other. Why? Because they all want to be recognized. They all want to be seen as the important one, the valuable one. So how does this work? It means I push you down so that I can be brought up high. Yeah, I talk, I I reduce you so that I can be seen, experienced. I dishonor you so that I can be honored. This is what is taking place. You may be recognized. Verse 20, when you come together, everyone say when. Okay, it's not if you come together. It's when you come together. Because if you're a part of the Christian church, coming together is essential. Gathering is an essential part of the Christian church. We are told, do not forsake the gathering of the assembly. Why? Because without your homeboys... Without your tribe, you will not make it in the days which we are going. Listen, that's not just for the first century church. That was certainly on a trajectory for massive devastation. This is a warning, an invitation for us here in Seattle, in the Pacific Northwest. Don't go with the flow, with the trajectory into isolation, thinking that isolation will lead to preservation. No, isolation will lead to devastation because our Christianity will not work in the days where we are going if we are alone. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. Now, I'm going to tell you how this would work. Um, In the first century church, um, the saints of God would come together, kind of like what we're doing right now. They would call this temple. They would come together. There'd be the reading of the Torah. There'd be the celebration of their ancient faith. But then what would they do? Daily, they would church it up as the ecclesia, the governing ones, okay, the called out ones. And they would gather, not in the temple from day to day, but they would gather in each other's homes. So they would temple together at temple, and then they would church it up at each other's homes 
homes. Now, this is how it worked. Just like today, back in the first century church, there were successful individuals and families and other families that, that, that man, they had to, they had a, a, a little more, um, they were financially challenged. Just like today, there are those that are financially independent. They've got a lot of freedom. There were others that were not financially independent, and they didn't have as much freedom. Now, the reason why this would be an issue was because, let's say every night we're churching it up at each other's homes. Scholars tell us that probably one of the largest churches in Corinth is only around 70 people. And gosh, that's a pretty big home, okay? I ain't doing 70 people in my home right now, okay? My next home, oh yeah. So anyways, um, <laughs> oh, it's on. <all. laughs> uh, okay, good time. I'm glad we established that. When does church begin? It begins when you get off work. All right, so for those that were financially independent and successful, church might begin at 4 p.m. We start to gather, okay? Now, people that had to work longer days, they might not show up till 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. So you know how successful you are by how early you get to church. Also, because one of the main core values in the kingdom of God is food, in the Bible, like whenever something cool happens, there's always food involved. <laughs> they would always eat together. Eating was such a big deal, but it was potluck style. So your family would bring your own meal. Now, you would know the success of a family by how nice the meal was, by the quality of the food and the quantity of the food. So you might have a very successful family. They show up early. They've got a couple ribeyes and a nice cab. Actually, they might show up with a, with a couple ribeyes and like five or six cabs, okay? And then you've got other families and they're showing up, and I'm not talking about taxis. You got other families that show up and they're getting there at seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. They don't have any food. They don't have any drink. This is what's taking place within the church. Check it out. He says here, for in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry while another gets drunk. Paul's response is he drops an explanation point. He goes, what? Paul, you know Paul T.O.'d when he, when he does a one word with an exclamation point. This is like when mom is like, Darren, start. That's three words. Like Paul drops. All right. You guys are having your own meals. One goes hungry. Another gets drunk. What? Check it out. He goes, don't you have houses to eat, eat and drink in? Like, if you're just going to get gluttonous and drunk, can't you do that at home? Why do you got to, like, rub that all up in, in people's faces that, that, that don't have what you have? He says, or do you despise the church of God? Do you dishonor the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Shall I commend you in this? No, not going to do it. Verse 22, he says, for I received through revelation from the Lord when I also delivered to you that the night Jesus was betrayed, took the bread, after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance, in honor, in celebration of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is what Paul says. When you come, you do your own thing. You do your own thing, and you just, and it's, and it's in excess. It is not worship. It's not bringing glory to the Lord. It's, it's gluttony. It's debauchery, and you're calling it worship. And then he contrasts it with, on the night Jesus was betrayed, took his bread and said, this is my life, which is broken for you. And he tore his bread and began to share his bread with the disciples, with those that he was in covenant with. And in the same way after dinner, he took his cup and he said, this is my blood and I give it to you. Take and drink in honor and celebration of me. 
He's contrasting those two elements. And then he says, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will soon be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. This is what he says. He says, hey church, he says, you are dishonoring a spiritual principle. And so because you're calling it spiritual, there's actually a spiritual consequence coming on you because of your lack of honor. You are, you are dishonoring the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. You're dishonoring Jesus Christ and his body, that is, the church. And in doing so, you're inviting judgment upon yourself. Verse 28, let a person examine himself. Who should you examine? Yourself. And stuff. And so, uh, it was, then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. I need a teleprompter. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks, discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That this is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Why? You've lost your value. You've lost your honor. You're engaging in a spiritual reality, yet there's this, this, last, this um, lack of honor, just this flippant, I mean, familiarity breeds contempt. And in doing so, engaging in these spiritual realities this way, you're inviting the judgment of God upon your body, upon your soul, upon your spirit, upon who you are. Some of you are sick. Some of you are not well. Some of you are cursed. Why? Because of your lack of honor. He says... Verse 31, but, everyone say but. but. If we judged ourselves true, it's funny. People that aren't Christians, they all know the same verse in the Bible. What verse is that? The verse that says, do not judge. How many of you have ever talked to somebody that there's not a Christian, they're going to go to church, you try and tell them about Jesus and they say, well, this is one thing I know. What do you know? The Bible says don't judge. Okay, where does it say that? I don't know, but the Bible says don't judge. That means don't judge. I feel like you're, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you, I'm not judging you. 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 But if you become a Christian, someone's going to have to judge you. Because we all will be judged. And this is what Paul says. Hey, you've been called to be a judge. Judge yourself. Judge yourself well. Judge yourself truthfully and honestly, right? This is what he says. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined. Why? Because he loves those that he disciplines, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together, wait for one another. Wait? That means we might be waiting until 8 o'clock. Yeah. Why? This is called communion, which is the celebration of communion and unity with the Father, the saints, and the family of God here and now. He says, wait. Wait for each other. Why? That's what love does. Imagine I invite you over to my house to eat. You come over to my house. We've already eaten. Why? You were late. Oh, gosh, I feel love. <laughs> if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. Let's pray real fast. Father, I imagine that there are places in our heart where we've been doing things a certain way for such a long time that maybe things that should be deeply spiritual have just become traditional. Lord, I imagine that there are things that we have taken for granted. Father, I imagine that there are things that we have access to that are incredibly valuable, that have lost their value. And I imagine within parts of our heart, there might be dishonor and the kind of dishonor that leads to compromise. Holy Spirit, we invite you to hover over our hearts and we ask that you would examine the parts of our hearts 
And I ask that we would have the humility and the honesty to respond and to be excellent judges of self before we engage your body and blood this morning. Lord, we take this moment just to hit pause, to invite your recalibrating spirit to come and to hover over the the next 10 minutes that we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. To honor means to value. And here we have a church that no longer values the body of Christ. They no longer value each other. And this can happen, this does happen, this has happened, even at SRC, even in my life, even even in a room like this morning, which is why we're reading this text together. This is why Holy Spirit has created this portal for us to come and engage this text here and now. Why? A a, a, a brother, one one of our new members, uh, uh, Travis, in the first service, he was talking to me out in the hallway. He said, we have the Bible, which is the word of God. And we read texts out of the Bible where it says, and God says. And he said to me, think about that for a second. God says, and then we have what God says. But because we've got all these pages with all these words, with all these times where God says, there's a lack sometimes of value, a lack of honor. Now the problem with that is, in the same way, that in order to purchase something on the earth, usually it takes money, it takes cash. That money is our primary currency within our country. I, there's been times that I didn't have money, and there's been times that I did. Money doesn't make you happy, okay? Um, but I'd rather have money <laughs> than not. In the kingdom of God, when it comes to the culture of heaven, honor is the currency of heaven. What we have here is we have compromise within the church because of a lack of honor, because of familiarity. And they are in the middle of a first century outpouring. People are getting saved, healed, delivered, delivered of demons. We see um, resurrection miracles. The power of God is in Corinth. And yet we see radical compromise. Why? Because of dishonor. When we honor something, we create value. Now, this is a bad example, but it's all I got. Here I have water. But this isn't just water. To you, this is just water. But I know something that you don't know. And this is what salespeople do, okay? So I'll put on a little act for you. It's not sealed. The seal's broken. Why? Because even though it says Kirkland Signature Purified Water, this is not from Costco. This is just the vessel. You see, the real water that's in here, I've had for a long time. In fact, I brought it back from Smithers, British Columbia. There is a glacier that's one of the purest glaciers. Scientists say it's actually one of the purest glaciers on the earth. And if you drink that glacier water, they're seeing crazy stuff. They're seeing people get skinny. Bald people grow their hair. Single people get married. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. It, does, it doesn't make sense. But I went up there and I got a bunch of it, okay? And I brought just a little bit with me today. And I'm willing to give a little bit to you. So if you've got a cup or something, I will pour a little bit into your cup for $50. Now, a second ago, this was just a 75-cent bottle of Costco water, but now everything's changed. Why? Because if I was being truthful and honest, there is the possibility that for $50, your whole entire life could change by drinking something that isn't menial and ordinary. It's something that's extraordinary. Why? Because I value it, I honor it, and it just created value in the entire room. That's what a salesperson does. You go and look at a car. (laughs) That is not just a car. (laughs) If you're just looking for a car, you're not looking for this car because this is not just a car. They create value. They bring you to a place where you'd be willing to make a decision. And in the body of Christ, this is what pastors ought to do with the word of God. 
No, 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 no. This isn't, these aren't just pages in a book. This is an ancient, unchanging manuscript. This is the God breathed, the God inspired. No, 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 no. These are, no, no, no. This isn't a $5 book. This is a life changing portal. This is an invitation. No, no, no. You, you don't read those words. Those words, they read you, and it's freaky. <laughs> Pastors ought to create value for the word of God. When we honor something, we create value. And this is what we need restored to the house of God, is value. This is what Paul says, you've forgotten what the Lord's Supper even is. You call it the Lord's Supper. It's not the Lord's Supper. For I recall on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. What's he doing? He's creating value. He's on that, no, 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 no. How dare you? That is not bread. That is not wine. That is the cup. That is the cup of the Lord. That is, that is his blood. And when you receive it with thankfulness, when you receive it with honor, when you receive it with faith, faith and honor, it activates something in the spirit. And if you dishonor it, it'll curse you. But if you honor it, it will release life and virtue into every part of you. This is the, this is the role of a godly husband to cherish his wife, to value his wife, to honor his wife. A husband should never wake up one day and just say, I don't think I love you anymore. I don't know who you are anymore. No, no, no. It is, it is our role to honor, and not honor with moderation, but honor with excess. Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, outdo one another in showing honor. Honor creates value. Read it with me. Honor creates value. And here's the problem. You're stinking rich and you don't know it. You are like multi-billionaires in the spirit, but you don't know it. Why? Because you live in your wealth every single day and you think it is ordinary. There's nothing ordinary about your husband. There's nothing ordinary about your wife. There's nothing ordinary about Seattle Revival Center. If you knew where you were at this morning, if you knew who you were sitting next to, and problem says, Paul says, this is your problem. Your problem is that you've forgotten who you are, you've forgotten whose you are, and you've forgotten what you're supposed to be doing when you gather. When you gather, you honor, you value, you create value. And in that place, there's an atmosphere of faith where nothing is impossible. My, my role is to use a little bit of time to create honor and value so that when you leave this place, you're like, wow, Jesus is legit. Wow, his presence is phenomenal. Wow, the word of God, wow, the Bible, who knew? Wow, people, wow, community, wow. My role is to make you say, wow. And what's your role when I'm doing my role? Your, <laughs> when we're engaging together, what can you do to honor and create value in the corporate context. When Melanie comes, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you, can, you can keep going. No, 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 she's not, no, 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 stop. She's not, she's not just some worship leader. she's singing she's not 
the worship leader. She's the lead worshiper. She's the lead follower, following Jesus because he's the worship leader. And as she follows Jesus and we get to follow Melanie, the question is, is while I'm in front, my, I was asking myself the question this morning, standing in front of my seat, what can I do here and now to create value for the presence of God that's in this place and to create value for what he's doing in the court? You see, here's the thing. Some people come to church and they don't really know why, but they do. And there's a some of you here in this service you don't really believe, you kind of believe, you don't believe, you do believe, but you're just kind of here. Cool, I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. God bless you. This is one of the best places that you could be here and now. Okay, but you're just kind of here. There's other people, and you come to church, and you're, you're, you're coming to engage. You don't really know what that looks like, but you're coming to engage. You're, you're going you're gonna to worship the Lord, you're going to read your Bible, you're going to maybe even take some notes, and you're, you're, your heart's here. And that's probably the majority of us here today is that we're, we're here to engage. But then there's a third category of people. They're eccentric. They're radical. They're over the top. And they're not just coming to engage. They're not just coming to receive of the glorious spirit of God. No, no, no. No, they came here prepared to create value and to create honor. They came here, and they're carrying something in their heart, and they just know that when I walk into the room, the atmosphere is just going to go up about three degrees. Why? Because I carry this place in my heart. I, I am hearing, I'm, I'm here not just to engage. I'm here to create. I'm here to value. I'm here to create honor. And, 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 it, and, doesn't, it doesn't, and, and I don't even want a microphone because my atmosphere, my presence, my engagement, it, 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 it carries something. It carries weight. I, God has called me here. I'm here so, so that my home group isn't menial. It's not ordinary. It's not tap water. I can't just throw my home group out with the, with the trash. That, that Sunday morning at SRC, it's not just another Sunday. It's not menial. It's not Costco, ta- it's not Costco water. It's not tap water. It's, it's, it's my marriage isn't menial. It's not ordinary. That if it's in my life, it's not menial. It's not ordinary. If it's in my life, it's because it's a good and perfect gift from God for this time and this space, and I will treat it with honor, and I will take care of it, and I will maintain it, and I will treat it as precious. And, and, if, and if it's in my life, you will know it's got value because it's in my life. I don't apologize for honoring Peter, my son. I don't apologize for honoring Abigail. I don't apologize for honoring Sophia. I don't apologize for honoring Mo. I don't apologize for celebrating. I don't apologize for talking about Seattle Bible Center and calling it the coolest church in, in, in the Pacific Northwest. Or like, I, This is the coolest church. I have the best leaders. Some of you are going to, hold on, some of you are going to have the best welcome luncheon that you'll ever have for the rest of your life. No, 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 no. You will have your best, or your money back. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, and that includes his son, Jesus, the one who lived and loved and gave his life as a ransom for us, his body and his blood. There's nothing ordinary about this service. So much is possible. Imagine if you went to work, but you didn't just show up. Well, I know it's post-COVID, so nobody shows up, but... Bad example. Your business, your school, whatever you're doing, don't be category one. I don't really know. <laughs> don't be a fart. <laughs> I'm sorry. That word still makes me laugh. It's inappropriate. I apologize. All right, number two. And don't be one that simply engages with moderation. Be excessive in your honor. Be excessive in creating value. Be excessive because I don't just drive a car. And I don't just have a wife. That's my wife. No, no, no. I have a queen. I have a prince. I have princesses in my home. I have a palace. I am part of the best church on the earth. And I talk that way and it creates value. I talk that way and it's offensive. Get over it. And I have the best God 
anyway, I have the, I have the only living, true God. And it's Jesus. And it's Jesus. And there ain't nothing ordinary about Jesus or his church. I'm glad we established that. Let's stand. If you have your communion elements, we'll take them out together. Paul says, I recall. He says, it was revealed to me that on the night he was betrayed. Think about that. He didn't have to say that. He's bringing a, a certain amount of gravity. It was revealed to me on the night he was betrayed by his best friend. He stopped the dinner. He stopped all the conversation. Everybody stopped talking. Why? Because Jesus was about to talk. And he picked up bread on the table. He said, this is no longer bread. This is no longer a wafer or whatever it is. And say you can eat it. It's no longer what it is. Why? This is now my body. <sighs> that is broken for you. Take and eat of my body. It says in the same way after, after dinner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is my blood. Take and drink and do it often. For as often as you do, you're honoring, celebrating, and receiving the finished work of my atonement. And in doing so, you're declaring a new covenant reality. In doing so, you're declaring the promise of my return. In doing so, you're receiving my very life-giving blood that allowed me to do what I was supposed to do for this 33 years on the earth. Now it's available for you to take, to drink, as your way of worshiping and honoring me and my love and my sacrifice. This is my blood. It hasn't been taken from me. This is my blood that I'm giving to you. So here, and he took the cup and he passed the cup. He said, take this. This is my gift to you. This is my gift to you. Take the cup this morning and receive it in remembrance of him. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your body, your blood, and this ecclesia that you've called us into. We used to be wandering and lost like those without a shepherd. But now we can declare with confidence, for the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You'll protect us, provide for us, call us your own. We love you forever, Jesus. Amen. Don't go anywhere.
What is something you can do today, not because you are asked to, but because you care? In doing so, you're honoring, and honoring, you're restoring value. And that's what God has called for us to do at Sierra Revival Center, is to restore value. Because there's a lot of things that we've called trash that's actually God's treasure. Love you. If you need prayer, I would like to invite you to come. Our pastors and uh, ministers will pray for you. Um, Otherwise, God bless you. And we'll see some of you downstairs. Thanks.